delighted to be here today on this very remarkable occasion of the ZIP lecture series. Sponsored by the Secretary and organized by the Faculty of Social Sciences in Namdi Azikiwe University, Oka. Today's event gives us an opportunity to reflect on the heroic efforts and huge contributions of the great Zik of Africa, Dr. Nandi Azikiwe, to the political freedom of the black race and the Dr. Nnamdazke was a true Democrat and foremost Pan-Africanist who dedicated his entire life to the firm establishment of democracy and equity. He clearly believed in the restoration of the dignity of mankind and was an ardent promoter of Nigeria unity by every standard. His qualities were rare and cannot be adequately captured in these brief remarks. He was a sound politician a role model by every stretch, leader of leaders, and a complete patriot whose character was worthy of emulation. I can conveniently call him father of modern Nigeria. A great leader with a sound mind, Dr. Azikiwe was the first indigenous governor general of the old Western region and first president of the Nigerian Senate. It is therefore against background, background of uncommon qualities that our own charismatic Ojeli Ibo instituted this annual lecture in his honor. In the past editions, different topical issues have been discussed by leaders and scholars towards finding solutions to Nigeria and indeed Africa's development. It is only true to say that since 1978, Senator Ben Obi has played active roles in the restoration of Nigeria democracy. As a former senator who represented Anambra Senate District, from 2003 to 2007, Senator Benobi was among other like-minded patriots who stood vehemently against the infamous Dalton agenda from seeing the light of the day in Nigeria. The special advice of affairs at some point, he joined the National Peace Committee under the Jonathan administration. It will be a highly principled crusader of the cross of the land In many respects, like the president of Africa, he is a great builder, a fire, a pan African, and of course, a great Nigerian patron. He is a man who plays politics without bitterness. The good, the good people of Anambra Central Central District, of course, identify with you on today's events. Let me ask you point. Let my brother, Professor VC, Vice Chancellor Esemono, the VC of Finisic. I want to appreciate you and your and your team. Let me also use this opportunity to welcome the wife of the man we are celebrating today. Mrs. And your son, the one that brought you to you. When being a senator representing an ambassador, I want to especially thank God Almighty for giving us peace, good health in the last election, even though the PDP contested very strongly in that election. People never believe the election could be free and fair. People never believe that there was peace. People never believe that nobody could be free. But God gave health, good environment, conducive atmosphere for free, fair, and credible election in Anambra State. I believe that the outcome of that election, the peace that changed the system in that election, gave every one of you the confidence to be in Anambra State today. So while commenting on that, I want to assure you that Anambra is not just the right of the nation. Anambra, Anambra leads. Why other states like Okiti follows? I want to say that <laughs> in fact that we are light of the nation, we are number one in everything, including peace. Sometimes when this happens, people don't know the communication behind that that happens. 
when it's about a month ago, nobody could believe that we gather here today to celebrate this great man, a great Nigerian, someone that impacted the democracy we're enjoying today in Nigeria. But we are here. Nothing is going on. Anambra is one of the most peaceful, peaceful. You can imagine. So, to my brother, Amy, and the, the president of a Boni governor at the estate, I want to ask that we have a permanent place for you. Yes, you want to relocate from your state, from your state. State is a state that God, in His infinite mercy, blessing, direct blessing from God. So the issue of insecurity is gone. The issue of poverty is gone. Another is prosperity, and prosperity continues in the country. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause for the senator. Yeah. Thank you. Another round of applause, please, for that. Before I call on my vice chancellor to give his um, address, the opening remarks, address by the vice chancellor, I quickly recognize Prince as a madam, the former deputy governor. Thank you, round of applause. No, he ne. You're welcome. Professor Charles, of the Simone, if I say SM. Our vice chancellor, we love you. I will be that We love you. We love you. Professor Simone, we love you. I will be that We love you. We love you so. I love that time. His Excellency, the Executive Governor of the Kibi State, Dr. John Kennedy Fine, the Chairman of Nigerian Governors Forum, who is our guest speaker for today, the Chairman of this nine and ten combines this lecture series. His Excellency Dr. David Umayyad will be represented by our own, powerful own, the Deputy Governor of the State, Barrister Dr. Kelechi Igwe. In the language of our distinguished senator, all the governors of Nigeria, because today all the governors of Nigeria are here, the governor of Enugu State, the governor of Anambra State, the governor of the state and all governors of various states, we are all represented here because this has to do with SIG. I recognize all of you. His Royal Majesties who are here, ably uh, led both physically and spiritually by Abogiri himself. I recognize you. I recognize you. Go to talk, I recognize you. And even if you know, we will present it by my body, recognize you. I'm on my own, I'm put it here. Which one I will make sure that this thing does not uh, appear. So I recognize all of the traditional rulers who are here. I thank all of you. I want to plead with us that for want of protocol, we will not go further. But I must not fail to very specially recognize the wife of the person whom we are here. This afternoon, Professor Mrs. Switch has away and your son recognize you in a special way. I also want to thank, I've done that before during the court circle, but I must not fail to do that publicly again. The benefactor of this six lecture series. This man is an enigma. This man is, uh, I don't know how to describe him. I'm still searching for what in the dictionary to describe. I chief senator, Dr. Ben Diobi, the heart he has, his interest in the peace, the unity of our nation, of our state, and the interest 
He has so put consciously, actively, in propagating the ideas of Dr. Namdi Azikiwe. Hi, Chief, and your wife. I want to thank you in a special way. I thank all our friends, Dekora, uh, thank VCO, and uh, Madam Maria. All of you who have come one way or the other, my principal officers, the deans and directors, heads of departments, and our dear students. Great university students! The greatest university students! Ladies and gentlemen of the press, I'm indeed delighted to welcome you all to the combined ninth and tenth rendition of the Zeke Lecture Series. After the hiatus of last year, that's 2020, constrained by the still extant COVID-19 pandemic, it is thus delightful that this year we are able to resume this quite important event. Important not only in the history of Unamdi Azikiwe University, but also the history of Nigeria. An event intended to remember the life and times of the right Honorable Unamdi Azikiwe, GCFR, acclaimed Africa, a redentist who was the arrowhead of Nigeria's independence struggle. I have the singular honor, and I've done that copiously, my opening remarks, to welcome our special guest, His Excellency Chief Dr. David Wenzumahi, who is ably represented by the Deputy Governor. He's the Chairman of South East Governors Forum, the, the special guest of honor of the South East, His Excellency Right Honorable. If I were in the group of being represented by the SSG, who is uh, Professor Atwanya. His Excellency Dr. Kizie Kazu, His Excellency Chief of Zodima of Imo State, His Excellency Dr. William Biano, very represented by the SSG Professor Solo Chukudebele. I want to also, in a special way, thank our royal fathers who are here present. And I must emphasize that their presence here is also giving us the spiritual coverage that we need to prosecute the activities of today. In a special way, because of time, I just want to mention that it's against the backdrop of the theme of this lecture, security governance and nation building. It may be better understood by the presentation that will be coming further because he who has the mantle today to make this presentation is himself a progenitor of peace and security as done that, as we heard uh, in the state, he has done that in the Southwest, and we'll be hearing from him. They say, we hear from the horse's mouth what we need to do to propagate this. I'm talking about the executive governor of the state and the chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum, Dr. John Kayode. Hire me. He has a broad education base and called in history, politics, and international studies, capping this with a doctorate in war studies, specializing in civil military relations from the famed King's College London. He also has a wide and variegated experience in public service. But I will not want to preempt his citation. I want to once more welcome Your Excellencies, Royal Fathers and our friends of Vietnam Gazikiwe University who are present today, University of All Times, and I say thank you and God bless you. I don't believe that's an applause. Thank you. Thank you, our Vice Chancellor, for that uh, very brief but warm address. Very quickly call on our benefactor, the Enigma. Accompanied by the wife, the Dichia Kabeno, okay? High Chief, Senator, Doctor, Ben, to make his own remarks. C-O-M. Thank you very much. One of our plus has to come up here. Thank you. The chairman of today's occasion, 
the executive governor of Ebonian State, Engineer Dave Umahi, heavily represented here by his deputy, Dr. Kelechi. I need to also mention that in his delegation are about six commissioners. Welcome to
of Political Science, the University Deputy Orator, Professor Frank Collins. Okafo. Please, a round of applause for him as he reads the citation of our guest lecturer. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, please permit me to stand on established protocol. Um, actually, I was given a mandate to do a one-page citation. And you know how difficult it is for a great man like this. I think it is as taxing as doing a doctoral dissertation, you know, to do a one-page work on this great man. However, uh, as a professor of political science and international relations, I will try my best to do so. An abridged citation of His Excellency John Coyote Fayemi, PhD, COM. Coyote Fayemi, Governor of Kitty State and Nigeria Governors Forum, is former Minister of Mines and Steel Development in the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 2015 to 2018. He led the administration's efforts in repositioning the Nigerian mining sector to contribute optimally to the priority agendas of diversifying the country's economic and economic base and creating jobs and economic opportunities for Nigerians. During his tenure as minister, he concurrently served as chairman of the governing board of the Nigeria Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. It was also the governor of the Kiti State in Southwest Nigeria, 2010 to 2014. Fire Me holds degrees in history and international relations from the University of Lagos and the Abafemi Awolowo University respectively a doctorate in World Studies from King's College, University of London, of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, University of Ibadan. His research and policy development interests include natural resource governance, democratic constitutionalism, security sectors, civil military and regionalism, in the global context. Amongst all public policy engagements at home and abroad, Dr. Faimi toured in Africa, the Americas and Asia. He has also served, he has also served as an advisor on transitional justice, regional integration, constitutionalism, security sector reforms, and civil military relations to various governments, multilateral institutions, and development agencies. Fire was the founding director of the Center for Democracy and Development, a research and training institute dedicated to the study and promotion of democratization, peace building, and human security in Africa. As a central figure in the coalition of civil society actors, that resisted oppressive military rule in, in the early, in the, he was central to the founding and running of opposition radio stations while in exile. His role in the struggle to restore democratic governance in Nigeria is documented in his book, Out of the Shadows, Exile and the Struggle for Democracy in Nigeria, published in 2005. His other publications include Missionaries, the African Security Dilemma, co-edited with Abdel Fatahou Musa in 2000. Deepening Democracy and Deepening the Culture of Constitutionalism, the Role of Regional Institutions in Constitutional Development in Africa in 2000, and, and Security Sector Governance in Africa, a handbook co-edited with Nicole Ball in 2004, then reclaiming the trust in Amandla 2012, and then regaining the legacy Amandla 2013 and the legacy of honor and service in Amandla 
2014. Dr. Faemi is a prominent member of the Governing All Progressive Congress, APC, and chaired the People's, the Party's National Convention Planning Committee that produced potential candidates for the 2015 general election and now president. He also served as the director, policy research and strategy of the APC Presidential Campaign Council. He was inaugurated as governor of the state for a second term on October 16, 2018. He is married to Erul BC Fayemi, the renowned women's and children's rights advocate, international development writer and social entrepreneur. He has received several awards and recognitions at home and abroad and holds the national honor of commander of the order of the Niger. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I humbly present to you the 10th Zik Lecture Series guest speaker, His Excellency, John Kayode Faemi, PhD, C-O-N. abridged oration by the university orator. You are the chairman of this important historic occasion, the 10th anniversary of the Zeke Lecture Series. The governor of Eboin State, Governor Dave Umahi, ably represented by the deputy governor. Excellency, the governor of Anambra State, my brother, Governor Willie Obiano, who is represented by the SSD. Uh, thank you for delivering that message, SSD. But my brother actually called to inform me that he was stepping out to rest. Uh, and I must thank him for making all the logistics arrangements for my stay in uh, Anambra. My other brothers who are ably represented here as well, the governor of Enugu, governor of Abia, and the governor of Imo. And if he's not here, the former deputy governor of Imo is here. <laughs> uh, our father is here. Uh, the chairman of the Anambra State Council of Traditional Rulers, who uh, is not just for Onitsha people or Anambra people, uh, but for some of us, a special father. And coming into the state today, my first port of call was the palace before coming over to uh, Okay. I will tell the story another day. Time does not permit me to go into my relationship with the Obio for Nature. Uh, and the immediate past chairman of Ekiti State Council of Traditional Rulers, the Alawe Filawe Ekiti, Oba Adebanji Alabi, Afuntade the first. Our mother is here, Professor Uche Azikiwe. And today really belongs to her and her family. The of the university, Professor Esimone is also uh, on site, and we're very delighted to. Uh, 
be here in your beautiful university. EOM Global. This EOM Global expo traverses the entire length and breadth of Nigeria. You may not know that. I can tell you of her exploits in Ekiti, but I won't go into those details. And of course, my own Egbon, Ojelibo, Senator Ben Indiobi, the benefactor who instituted this very important lecture series and his lovely wife the President General of Ohaine is in Dibo. My Oga and um, teacher who is also ably presented by Dr. Ambassador K. Muche, who is the General of the uh, Ohaine is in Dibo. The former Deputy Governor of Eki, to Sovio Abiodo and Luko, who also happened to be of this great university. The great Zeke is gone, but his legacy lives on. Senator Ben India, before keeping the faith as a relentless Zikist, a man of prodigious intellect and a cerebral politician of a special heat. It is no surprise that he has kept the lamp of intellectualizing Zik's memory aglow in a generation that is inherently cynical about intellectualism. I would also like to pay tribute to those who have mounted this venerable podium before me and I acknowledge the invaluable contributions they have made to the development of our country and humanity as a whole. I find myself privileged to share this podium with such great names as former president of Ghana, late president John Jerry Rawlings, the former president of Tanzania, Benjamin Nkapa, former president of Sierra Leone, Dr. Ernest Bai Koroma, former Kenyan prime minister, Raila Odinga, our own former vice president here, Atiku Abubakar, Nobel Laureate, Professor Wale Shoinka, former Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Chief Emeka Anyaoku, distinguished academics, Professor Asisi Asobi, and a host of other distinguished personalities who have spoken on the Zik Lecture Series in the last decade. I'm indeed humble that I am standing on such shoulders, shoulders of giants. Accepting the invitation as this year's guest lecturer was intimidating, but not difficult at all, given what the late Dr. Nambi Azikiwe has meant to and continues to represent for all of us in Africa and in Nigeria particularly. 26 years after his transition to eternity on 11th May 1996 at the ripe age of 92, the indelible legacy which he left during over seven decades of active and inimitable service to humanity, Africa, and our beloved Nigeria continues to provide us inspiration and a fountain of wisdom on which to draw, especially in troubled times. It is therefore appropriate from the outset to salute the memory of this great nationalist, frontline hero of our independence, founding father, statesman, pan-Africanist, community leader, and humanist. In his time, Dr. Nambi Azikiwe scored many firsts that can only be recalled with awe and admiration. He was among the pioneering university-educated Africans who sojourned to the United States in their quest for knowledge and self-improvement. He was also a pioneering sportsman, public intellectual, journalist, newspaper proprietor, 
with at least 12 daily titles in its table point in time, including the popular West African pilot, owner of a Pan-Nigerian athletic club, and a pick offer. Served as the first chief minister, premier of the Eastern region, first indigenous governor general of our country, became a republic in 1963, Nigerian to be named of the United Kingdom. A truly bad person who built himself up through hard work, a single-mindedness of purpose, an uncommon audacity, and a commitment to the freedom and unity of the African world, even in the face of personal adversity. There are many lessons for all of us in his rich life story. Unsurprisingly, no conversation about the propagation of the Pan-African ideal, the struggle for decolonization of the African continent, and the shaping of the political evolution of post-colonial Africa can be credible or complete without a fulsome and robust acknowledgement of the contributions of Dr. Benjamin Nambi Azikiwe. As a towering figure in the global Pan-African movement, Azikiwe broke bread at various times with other icons of the cultural rebirth and the speedy restoration of the dignity of black persons all over the world, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, C.L.R. James, Kwame Nkrumah, and George Padmore, to cite only a few. From an early stage through his writings, he invested himself single-mindedly in thinking through the ways in which the continent could be reinvented as a dignified home for all persons of African descent. His 1937 book entitled Renaissance Africa remains a classic in the Pan-African pantheon. And as an indefatigable fighter for the right of all colonized Africans to self-determination and independence, he effortlessly found common cause with other key figures of the African anti-colonial movement, such as Albert Macaulay, whose right hand associate and successor he subsequently became, Ahmed Bembela, Julius Nyerere, Jomo Kenyatta, Estins Kamuzu, Kenneth Kaunda, the Magai brothers of Sierra Leone, Ituri, among others. Within the Nigerian context, and building on the foundation laid by Herbert Macaulay, he forged various bonds of collaboration across the Niger with leading Nigerian nationalist politicians, such as Tobafomi Awolowo, Alva Nikoku, Amino Kano, Amadou Bello, Abaka Tafawa Balewa, Hannes Tikoli, Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, Michael Umodu, Zana Buka Dipcharima, Mokogu Okoye, and Gambo Sawaba, among many, many others. As the towering figure of the Nigerian nationalist movement, it has been argued with considerable justification that no one could have crowned, could have been crowned by destiny to be more essentially Nigerian than Dr. Inambia Ezekiel. With his ancestry right in the heart of Igbo land in the East, an umbilical cord deep in the soil of Zungeru in the north, and professional career nurtured in Yoruba land in the west, Dick was the complete all-rounded Nigerian who spoke the three major languages, who spoke the three major languages in the country fluently and more than any of his contemporaries, was very easily at home in all parts of the country, including the different places in which he sojourned as a child, student, young professional, and frontline politician. Many have a potentiality to be great. Azikiwe had the genius to translate that potentiality into a reality that has outlived him. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have gone to some length 
to paint a picture of Dr. Ezekiel with just as a gentle reminder to us all that the example of the Colossus of Apollon were gathered here today to celebrate tells us that despite all the odds Nigeria has and continues to produce giants whose remarkable deeds leave indelible marks in the sands of time for us to harvest and profit from. What said Zik, contemporaries apart from others, was not that they were perfect people, but the fact that they were perfectly wedded to their forward-looking ideas about the place of the African, and indeed the Nigerian in the world. In this regard, Zik believed in the power of knowledge and ideas as an important pathway to achieving the African Renaissance and for restoring the dignity of global Africa. No matter how old an individual may be, Zeke once said, no matter if young or old, if he thinks in accordance with the times, he is immortal. Dr. Ezekiel's immortality is based on the power of his pragmatic thoughts and ideas, which remain relevant to our continuing experience as Africans, regardless of ethnic or religion. The overarching theme of this combined ninth and 10th lecture series is security building. It is timely, it's a timely subject for us to reflect upon collectively, given the myriad of intertwining security and governance challenges we are all having to deal with in Nigeria, and indeed in many other places around the world. I cannot help but wonder if the great Sikh were to be alive today, what he would have to say to some of the many challenges that face us as a nation. What would have been Zeke's idea of nation building amidst the centrifugal forces emerging from almost all parts of the country to challenge the foundations of our nationhood as a united Nigeria? It seems to me that it would be fair to say, as Zeke would have done, that national security and development are dependent on a resolution of the national question and the associated demands of nation and state building. History and comparative experience teach us that where a broad consensus has been built on the fundamental issues underpinning the national question, it becomes much easier to attain and to sustain. One of the most critical factors for the success of any nation is the achievement of of a broad and enduring consensus amongst the elite drawn from the various walks of life on a fundamental set of questions that are germane to the establishment and nurturing of a stable foundation for the pursuit of security and development. Yet, on the other hand, this is not a charge to be left to political elites only, as doing so is bound to create resentment and feelings of exclusion among lay citizens. A nation's theory of development can only derive from the consensus that has been forged on key national, especially those questions related to the issues of identity, religion, participation, justice, and the overall management of diversity. How these are mobilized to define the value of citizenship and to set the parameters for inclusion or exclusion within the nation's socioeconomic and political space. As such, there can be no successful nation building in our current climate, where a wide section of our citizens are apathetic to the very idea of the nation state and perceive the political institutions that govern them as enemies. For many, nation building is no more than an age-old idealistic rhetoric that has no bearing on lived realities. My argument has always been, though, that we cannot speak of national development without first resolving the key issues of nation building. I make bold, therefore, to say 
that the security challenges that are confronting us in all their various dimensions and ramifications and all the issues of governance instability that we are confronted with are directly consequential upon our inability to settle fundamental questions of nationhood and find points of convergence in a plural society like ours. Where the very existence of the nation question at the slightest provocation, it should serve as a warning to us. The foundation upon which the nation is standing is either weakening or has collapsed. In either case, measures aimed at reinforcing that foundation must be adopted speedily, settling our foundational challenges and doing so frontally is the sine qua non for the successful forging of consensus that is needed for moving the country forward with a unity of purpose, a common vision of our greatness, shared values of solidarity, and a sense of equity and justice. Yet, the challenges of nation building are not exclusive to Nigeria or African states as is often ascribed. Our squal model nation states in the West are falling short of their cohesive ideals and grappling with the challenges of national divisiveness. In the case of Nigeria, some have argued with some merit, I must admit, that we cannot build Nigeria into a truly united nation until we somehow boil down all our ethnic and other differences into one homogeneous melting pot. For the nation to live, the tribe must die, was declaring the Westphalian model of the modern nations in Europe. But history has shown, however, that difference is a permanent of the human condition does not preclude the not of bonds that you need. Moreover, human beings have natural affinities to their ethnic and linguistic groups that are too to be simply swept aside artificially. None of us chose to be Nigerians, but having found ourselves in this geographic space called Nigeria, we're left with two real alternatives is to make it work for everyone, is to break it up and let everyone return to their ethnic enclaves. The latter option has never proven to be better or more sustainable than the former. Speaking in the context of Nigeria's three regions in the early years of our independence, Dr. Zikiwe noted as follows, and I quote, each of our three regions is vastly different in many respects, but each has in common that despite variety of languages and customs, difference in climate, all form part of one country, existed as a political and social entity for 50 years at the time it was that is why we believe that the political union of Nigeria is destined to be perpetual and indestructible. It was a message to say that despite differences of various times, we are not confronted with cleavages that are insurmountable as we invest in the building of enduring parameters of nationhood. No political union is created perfect, and none enjoys perfection as a permanent condition. What is encouraging, and which Nambi Azikiwe understood and preached always, is that through visionary leadership, doors are open for us to invest in forging a more perfect union from generation to like most of his contemporaries, Zeke acknowledged our diversities in ethnicity, religion, tongues, and custom, but he regarded Nigeria as the motherland. I believe that in choosing to describe Nigeria as a motherland, he was being deliberate. 
no one gets to choose their mothers or change their mothers. Relationship that is perpetual and indestructible. In the context of the many historical events that are independence, some have been tempted some partisanship to suggest that perhaps Zeke had too much faith in the project Nigeria or allowed himself to be blinded to the many dysfunctions that have racked the nation building process. In my considered opinion, both suggestions are wrong and unhelpful insofar as they betray a fundamental understanding of the roots of his nationalism, which set great store by unity in the match to greatness. As a key architect in the making of contemporary Nigeria, it would have been too much to expect that Azikiwe will also easily embrace a path that will lead to its dismemberment. To do so would have amounted to a wholesale self-repudiation. The greatest test which he faced came at the onset of the Nigerian Civil War and the polarization which required all key actors to pitch their tents with one side or the other in the conflict. It had to be one of the most difficult moments in his entire political life, watching the potential disintegration of Nigeria while also seeking to understand the fullness of the grievances in Eastern Nigeria that unfold the drive towards the creation of the Afra. One of the enduring controversies of the Nigerian civil was the actual role that Dr. Azikiwe played or did not play in that conflict. It was the real life equivalent of being caught between a and a hard place. Treading with the utmost caution, it dig out his neck to make a plea for the abandonment by the conflicting parties of the resort to violence and the resumption of dialogue. Perhaps there is something in this approach that contemporary gladiators in the ongoing challenges to Nigerian nationhood may want to take as food for thought. Like all people imbued with a profound intellect, his favorite strategy for tackling differences was encapsulated by the French word parliament or parliament in English which means discussions, meetings, or negotiations until a compromise can be forged. In the fight for Nigeria's independence, Zeke insisted, and I quote him, we will not shed blood. We will not force the British to shoot at us. And he advised all of his fellow anti-colonial nationalists around Africa to adopt the same strategy. In embracing the philosophy of non-violence, Zeke was undoubtedly influenced by his experience with the civil rights movement in the United States and the example of Mahatma Gandhi. Apart from a deep commitment to humanism and the sanctity of human life, Zeke's nonviolence was also born out of pragmatism. He did not think there was any wisdom in taking to the battlefield against an enemy that is more powerful than you. However, armed with the heavy artillery of your intellect and the morality and justness of your cause, you can make an enemy retreat. Dialogue, according to Zeke, is more compelling, and oftentimes be even more resounding than the staccato of the Kalashnikov. Zeke's nonviolence also had nothing to do with the surrender mentality, as some have suggested. Thus, even as he made efforts to stop the Nigerian civil war from becoming an inevitability and escalating, he also made it clear that justice, fairness, and equity in the administration of the Commonwealth were fundamental preconditions for peace and unity to be won and sustained. He called for an end to the war hostilities and the reintegration of the Biafrans back into Nigeria, provided he said, and I quote, that Nigeria will continue to ensure the safety of persons and properties of Biafrans in one united country where all its citizens will be treated as equals without any discrimination and where there will be opportunities 
for all citizens and inhabitants. End of quote. History has taught us that wars, especially civil wars, could be one of our a country's self-introspect and find its true identity and a pathway to transformation. As with the American Civil War, which historians have suggested was also America's war of socioeconomic transformation, there have been suggestions that out of the wreckage of the Civil War, Nigeria might successfully reconstruct itself and move on to the path of structural change. All things considered, amidst the optimism unleashed under the banner of the three R's of post-war reconstruction, reconciliation, and reintegration. Few will disagree that we are yet to achieve the high hopes that flourished amidst the oil boom of the 1970s, that we were well on the way to fulfilling our destiny to greatness. With persistent challenges of state and nation building and a myriad of developmental discontents, the rise of separatist agitations in recent years and the rhetoric of such agitation indicates that there are still people in this country, indeed many of them, who feel that Nigeria is not working for them, who still feel marginalized in the scheme of things, who frame this discontent in ethnic, religious, or regional terms, and who believe that the only solution is for them to be at go and form their own country. It is important to note that complaints about marginalization are not exclusively or always solely directed at the federal center. With regions and states that have made up the Nigerian Federation at various times since 1960, people who feel are not getting a fair deal or equality of opportunity also complain of marginalization. The standard solution that has been pursued has been to clamor for more states in the expectation that the interests of those who feel marginalized will be better served own to themselves. Go by the persistent agitation for the creation of more states to assume that content at our level is real, persistent, and widespread. Since the 1946 Richards Constitution, three regions of the Nigerian Federation, agitations for the creation of, of more regions had been rife, particularly among the minority ethnic groups. The subsequent creation of states in 1967, 76, 87, 91, and 96 has not stemmed the vociferous demand for more states. While the 2005 National Political Reform Conference set up by the Obasanjo administration concluded that the creation of new states was not feasible, the 2014 National Conference by the Jonathan administration recommended the creation of 18 new additional states to make Nigeria into a federation of 54 states. The infinite political market for the creation of an ever increasing state in the Nigerian federal system is an indicator of the fact that the successive rounds of state creation, which we have had to date, have not produced the Eldorado Successive generations of agitators thought the exercise would produce. The more states are created, the more new perceptions of marginalizations have multiplied. It cannot be viable to steer the country into an overfragmentation that cancels out the effectiveness of the administration of the common good. Another argument by those who are still clamoring for the creation of more states is that doing so will bring government closer to a particular people who are otherwise marginalized under a current arrangement. Even if this were true, it's debatable whether mere geographical proximity can deliver good governance and improve the quality of the people without a corresponding commitment to development generally. Shared geographical does not automatically translate into shared resources an equitable and fair distribution. Solidarity can at times be situational, and if there is nothing more than agitation for states without deeper commitments to what constitutes shared values, 
between state and citizens the center may not hold. There is no such thing as a homogeneous society, not even a homogeneous family. The ties that bind are the mutually shared values that accommodate differences. In the absence of this, conflict is almost always inevitable. Perhaps of greater concern is the growing evidence that many of our states are fast becoming economically unviable. This situation will get worse as the amount that will be available for allocation from the center dwindles in tandem with the decline in oil revenues. It is therefore real to argue that the solution to the problem of lack of equity or marginalization within a state, not the creation of more states, which may end up only creating new arenas of conflict. Even if it were possible to ensure that only people of the same ethnic group or religion occupy a state, this will still not stop the complaint of marginalization as some people would always be better off than others. I am from one of the most homogeneous states in Nigeria, and I can confirm to you that there is still agitation of marginalization. The argument against the agitation for the creation of more states can also be extended to those who think that the best solution to the problem of real and or perceived marginalization in Nigeria is outright secession from the country. While it is easy to understand the sentiment that drives the kind of extreme positions adopted by groups like the Masob or IPOB or Odua National Movement, one will still have to question whether this is indeed the best solution in the best interest of the people on whose behalf they have claimed to pursue the struggle. In attempting a response, it may be pertinent for us to remind ourselves of the experiences of countries that have faced the same kinds of challenges to unity and nationhood in recent times. I would like us to pause and look at the experience of these countries. Amidst massive global goodwill, South Sudan declared independence from Sudan in 2011 following an agreement signed in 2005 to end what was regarded as Africa's longest civil war. According to sources, the war was fought to resist Islamization and Arabization by the North, preserve their ethnic identity as Africans, animists, and Christians. The discovery of rich deposits of crude oil in the South also added fuel to the conflict and reinforced agitations for separation, especially after the death in an air crash of the historic leader of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, John Garang. Expected independence to bring the long overdue peace to the Sudan, North and South were sorely disappointed when within two years of winning to self-determination, a civil war broke out within South Sudan itself leading to the death of over 400,000 people and the displacement of an estimated 4 million more. In the period since then, the young country has alternated between conflict and uneasy peace, complete with a UN peacekeeping mission. In the meantime, in what was left of Sudan after the separation of South Sudan and its accession to various mini conflicts underwritten by an assault challenging the authority in Khartoum have been the order of the day. Darfur in Sudan became both an embodiment and symbol of the tragedy of war that befell the country, even as South Sudan was also locked in a violent struggle for power driven, uh, power -driven by interethnic distrust and an unreconstructed system of political monopoly. Since the ousting of President Omar al-Bashir in 2019, the North itself had been trapped in an unhappy transitional arrangement that has culminated in a second flexing by the military of its muscle in the domestic political process. So those who are sold on the logic of secession may counter this analogy by, by outlining the differences between South Sudan and southeast of Nigeria. 
and how the outcome of independence will be different in both cases. It is true that while the Southeast of Nigeria is relatively homogeneous in language, culture, and religion, South Sudan has about 60 different ethnic groups. However, it is important to remember that when we are united against Khartoum for independence, the South Sudanese put up a united, practically homogeneous front. The breakdown in their unity only burst into the open as independence loomed. No matter how homogeneous it may appear, no society is ever left of differences and cleavages that require to be managed on an ongoing basis through engaged and visionary leadership. If the simple fact of ethno-cultural homogeneity was an absolute guarantee for stability and progress, we may never have had a cycle of genocide in Burundi and Rwanda or broken Somalia on our hands. It is therefore safe to state that while diversity does not guarantee a slide into war, homogeneity does not guarantee a sustained peace either. In fact, as the award-winning author Yuval Harari has argued, it is by our common conflicts and dilemmas that we define our identity, not by our common traits. Therefore, he observes, the people we fight most often are our own family members. Identity is defined by conflict and dilemmas more than by agreement. And as we say in Yoruba land, it is the person that you lie in the same place that you bump into. We learn to manage our differences and do so in order to achieve the goal of a better and a more perfect union. If separation and secession are not as easy or simple as their proponents imagine, and given that they do not provide any guarantees that a better future can be secured through them, demands for a national restructuring will seem to me to be worth keeping on the table for deeper consideration. In doing so, we have a duty to frame and contextualize the cost for restructuring as part of a normal process of regular and periodic adjustment and recalibration of governance arrangements to changing times and context. Represent a departure from the negative and adversarial conditions which proponents and of restructuring, turning it into another source of rancor, recrimination, and division. However, at the end, when all the dust around the issue settles, we find that we are all confronted with the same fundamental question. How do we make Nigeria work best for every Nigerian? Like the great Zeke posited, how do we build a nation where the safety of every citizen is assured and where there will be equal opportunities for all, regardless of the language they speak, the place they come from, or how they worship God. Dr. Nnamdi Azikiwe envisioned a country that would be perpetual and indestructible on account of its ability to remain adaptive and responsive to the shifting challenges and its commitments to meet the aspirations of every generation of Nigerians. The indestructibility of Nigeria as envisaged by Zeke, is indeed best assured when the majority of Nigerians are emotionally connected to Nigeria because of what Nigeria is able to do for them. In essence, the legitimacy of the nation state is not in making demands of patriotism, and the quality of life it provides for its citizens towards building mutual trust and the common good. The question therefore is this, is Nigeria as currently structured, capable of delivering the full benefit of citizenship to every Nigerian? The answer to this is obvious. Certainly, the growing army of our frustrated and disenchanted youth do not think so. One might even argue that our generation of young people are engaged in alternative spaces of micro nation building projects, their own, in the arm of a perceived nurturing state. We see this in the ways common identities and aspirational notions of what Nigeria could be in new media spaces, 
entertainment, and other forms of identity-making projects you have taken up and successfully too. Yet, when the Nigerian story is told, we very often focus on a disproportionate amount of attention what does not work about our union. And perhaps that in itself may not be a bad thing if rather than being weaponized to undermine our collective will, it is framed as a clarion call to do more and do better and with greater purpose. It is important also not to forget that there exist important glues that bind us together as Nigerians. Of our differences and these glues also de deserve to I am convinced that the problems that we are called upon to address and redress in building a better are not beyond our grasp to tackle. With good faith and a generous dose of goodwill, we can, as we have done on various occasions in our history, summon that Nigerian genius to build on the things we have successfully erected together. We must strive to do so in the spirit of the kind of noble values and principles that inflame the spirit of a youthful Azikiwe to enroll at Lincoln University in a quest to discover the innate goodness in the human species with a view to building a freer world. We must never abandon the spirit of inquiry and discovery that led Azikiwe to join other nationalists to create a nation state founded on the best ideals of citizenship and code on freedom and justice. We, the people of Nigeria, must truly mean that our concerns are fed into the document that will form the fundamental organizing principle of our nation. The opportunities are there. The question of how to develop our democratic system that meets the expectations of our people and restores pe people's trust in government, how to bring ethical principles, empathy, and efficiency into the heart of government and leadership at all levels, how to harness our demographic advantage and translate our youth population into an asset rather than a time bomb, how to build a society that is governed by the rule of law, how to build an electoral system that is reliable and efficient, or how to build a trusted, dependable, and efficient judiciary. All these are at the very heart of what we see as the broad package of restructuring that we need to work towards. It is a package around which we can forge a broad consensus. And I believe that we don't need to go through another war or tear down our country to arrive at such a consensus. Of course, many amongst us would like to ask me that if I'm so confident that we can resolve these issues through dialogue or any other form of parliament, how come such previous efforts have failed to lead to the desired outcomes? My answer will be that the national transformation that we seek can only happen through the transformation of the individual and the individual's transformation in relation to fellow citizens and in relation to the nation itself. People create systems and not the other way around. It is, only, it is only by the transformation of the individual that we can hope to do that which is necessary for the transformation of our country. While the notion of social contract is central in exploring the relationship between the state and citizens, as the rabbi and moral philosopher Jeffrey Sachs reminds us, it is inadequate in dealing with our current challenges simply because social contract creates a state. Social covenant creates a society. Social contract is about power and how it is to be handled with a within a political framework. Social covenant is, is about how people live together despite their differences. Social contract is about government. Social covenant is about coexistence. Social contract is about laws and their enforcement. Social covenant is about the values we share. Social contract is about the use of potentially coercive force. Social covenant is about moral commitment, the values we share and the ideals that inspire us to work together for the sake of the common good. For me, 
This encapsulates the idea of nation building at its best. A contract must be founded on cohesion, a covenant to stay true to the agreed contract. All parties must agree to avoid contestations, achieving a sense of common identity, strong institutions, and shared values as a nation is a process of building trust and finding unity in difference. This is how we build the sort of national relationship that is not an exploitative social contract, but a moral commitment that combines individual and state obligations. Permit me to conclude with this admonition. Regardless of how long it takes and whatever we do in between, war or violence is never an option. Believe me, I should know. I hold a doctorate degree in war studies. Therefore, I feel adequately qualified to speak about the futility of war and violence. There is absolutely nothing heroic about dying foolishly for a cause for which dialogue and negotiation, negotiation can provide pathways to workable solutions. <laughs> Whatever is worth fighting for is worth staying alive for. I can very much hear this refrain flowing from the life experience and legacy of Dr. Nandi Azikiwe. And if the great Zeke were alive today, this is precisely what he would be telling this August gathering. Let us hack into his words of wisdom for listening. <laughs> Another round of applause. So. <laughs> um, okay. Um, may we be seated. This has been wonderful. Uh, I don't know. The way we have uh, received it has shown that His Excellency has done remarkably well. Well, I will... Please, let's, we are still in the program. Let us be able to separate the euphoria of enjoying his lecture and outright noise. His Excellency, sir, since we have learned that you have a degree, a, a doctoral in war studies, anybody that has anything to do with war in Igbo land is called Ochiaga. Ochiaga means the general in battle. So you are general in the battle of war studies. Once again, you are welcome. Please, another round of applause for him. Uh -huh. um, please. Hello. Hello. Sharing that down there. Okay. Okay, let us, um, I've been redirected. Please stop sharing what is disturbing us. We can do that later. Let us proceed to cut the cake. My Vice Chancellor, sir, Chairman of the occasion, His Excellency, cutting of the cake. I crave indulgence to ask that we all um, come down gently. Chancellor, sir, and uh, His Excellency, Chairman, please. 
Um, you see, you might want to. Okay, we are going to cut this cake after the spelling of our great sick of Africa. Uh -huh. Just a second. I will get it. We are going to stretch. KBC should come. We are going to cut this cake after the spelling of the name of the great Zik. We'll make it short. We'll just spell Z I K and then we'll cut the cake. Okay? Ready? Go one, two. Z I K. Z I K. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Let's resume our positions. Please, let's settle down. I indulge on the members of the head table to come back to their respective seats. And Abogidi will take over now to make a, uh, a few remarks. Abogidi Nadi Kennelly Abogidi Niadi Abogidi 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 Abogi <laughs> Ne messi be koliva ne Please, uh, we have not ended. May we resume our seats, please? May we retire to our seats, please? Get us Let's retire to our seats, please. My distinguished members of the head table, I ask that we come back to our seats so that we continue. I ask that we come back to our seats. I ask that we have finished the cake cutting, the cake cutting, 
and I believe that we come back to our seats. Because I not make you take our seat, you. No, for the Valentine, I don't Because no, I don't know. Now, what did you get that? Because no, I Let us, with a round of applause, welcome Obi of Furniture. If we Nemeka Alfred actually, please round of applause. Abu he wants to make a few yeah. remarks. Please, thank you, thank you. Namalize mo ne koko na na gagali. Biko no si nola. Go. Go on, make an eye open now. Have we lost control? Master of ceremonies. Have we lost control? So, um, the vice president of the university, our distinguished lecturer, who just finished his job and left us, the benefactor, Wanaku, Wanaku. Emeritus Professor Mrs. Kiwe. Now, we are working, we are as Kiwe. The chairman of the occasion, the governor of the Boy State, who is uh, very well represented by your own son and alumnus, the deputy governor, who can now stand on established protocol. And I want to touch on two points. One is the one that the governor or the keynote speaker has dwelt extensively on today. The question of nation building and the need for peace based on equity, fairness, justice so as to create opportunities for development. The last several months, particularly in Anambra State, have been very, very volatile in a very unprecedented manner. But also it was the same in the Southeast. And the Southeast uh, zone became the last of all the six zones in Nigeria to be engulfed in violence. And 
our experience in the last three to four years has been unparalleled in our history in the country since the end of the Civil War. <clears throat> We're asking ourselves why and where do we go from there? And I think our keynote speaker today has eloquently addressed that subject. If only we would listen. If only the Nachani would listen. If only the Awandian Nachachi would listen. So that together we can build a nation that's not only great, but it's also fair, equitable, that gives particular attention to our youth. Youth comprise over 60% of our population. Today and tomorrow belongs to them, not to people like me who are already we've had our own time and so on. So I will not go too much on that, but let's touch base a bit on our election, which I just completed. An umbrella was boiling and we lost a few people. People don't deserve to die. And then suddenly we had a peaceful election and orderly election. An election that was seen as transparent. It didn't work by magic. And let us not believe that Chukufly Nanya was more than a Jew, that he gave us that. It was a result of very hard work under the table to create that opportunity. But if you can have a peaceful election, that will hopefully give us the beginning, the starting point, hopefully in Nigeria. It has happened. But then we don't take it for granted. We don't go to bed saying, thank God peace has come back because we don't know whether peace has come back or not. The unknown gunmen, who are they? We still don't know who the unknown gunmen are. If you don't know who they are, you cannot live with them and they can erupt tomorrow. So Buko, I get Shankucha. There's a lot of work to be done. And if you follow the news, you will have seen the messages from the representatives of bishops and archbishops of the Southeast, those from the Southeast Traditional Council and and religious leaders, and even messages that were also issued and signed by most of the contestants to the recent election. I think the contestants themselves, um, at least a couple of them have been with us here today, know, again, the work that has been done. So Buko, if I am young, there's a lot of work to be done to build peace and be part of building peace in Nigeria as a prerequisite for the on equity based on fairness. Now, Emen Waka Melibie, but I would like to end them. The only other topic I would like to touch upon today, which is the reason why we are here today, is Nam Diazikiwe, the Right Honorable Dr. Nam Diazikiwe, Owele Osowa Anya Nonicha, above uh, all the other things he has done in Africa, Nigeria, and all of that. Here is a man who was born of middle class uh, background, and had a very sound education, and worked very, very hard. As in America, on a church bus to earn a living to, to, to support himself. That's, you have to wash buses in the bus, bus, in the bus station and all that. And to wash your bus, you have to move it out from the garage to wash it. He couldn't drive, so he made a deal with his, uh, his, his, his fellow. Uh, bus washer that the guy will drive all the buses out and he will wash all the buses which is a very hard way to make a living one day his colleague didn't show up and he couldn't drive the buses out and he lost his job but he still came back a great man had all his education and became our shining light after Ochiso Wanini Shia Nigeria he came back to Onicha as a member of the OB in council, the traditional council. Initially, the title of Uziani, which was a second class gather. 
then became a well which is the first class character. And just like he's left volumes of knowledge in writing for posterity, in governance, in politics, he's also left the same amount of material for us for Nisha, for Nisha tradition, for Nisha culture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can imagine what a man Nandia Zikulu was from global politics, Nigeria governance to traditional governance. In Bakonya, the number of years he grew up in Nandia was not too much. The true Godzilla, that he has a mind that can pick up everything, analyze and give you a result so much. So there's no way, there's no how much you can do to honor Nambia Zikwe, but also to study Nambia Zikwe, to learn who he was, to learn how God endowed him, to learn from what is left behind us. Therefore, if a mere tata, the 10th anniversary, the laying of the foundation stone of the Zik Center at Unison, it's a major step towards creating a, a, a basis to study Nambia's career. But before that, any state government has also taken the complex. And I understand, and reliably so, that the center, the Zig center, is almost ready to go into function in Enugu. Uh, SSG, Professor Toya. Well, we cannot thank him enough for that step that he has taken. Because until that, for almost 26 years, there's a six masolium on each other. It's in line there. Every government at the federal, I'm sorry to say, my SSG is got away, but you'll get the message. Our government and federal government have been dedaling for 26 years. The last time there was attention there was the last federal election where the federal government came and then disappointed. But nothing has happened. They set up a, a presidential committee to make it functional under the federal ministry of works. How can federal ministry of works manage the center for studies? <laughs> eh? Ministry of works. Federal Minister of Works is in charge of six persona. How can they manage it? It is supposed to be under the National Commission for Museums and Monuments. That's where it ought to be. So, Buko Yerumaka, Yananyaka, to tell the federal government and Anambra State government to do what is necessary to do. Are you going for that? You should hand over the institution to Anisha community. I will run it, we will manage it and run it. But back in energy, now Tata Bubo, that's not getting in Ruka. So today we have beginning, and there's a promise that it will be completed before the VC finishes its uh, term of office of a Zig Center in Unis. And we have his name, thanks to the state government. And with those two, we will force the federal government and Amra state government to get going with the Macedonian, where Nambia's Bureau is lying peaceful. And the three of them combined, I think, will help us reposition Nambia's Bureau in the of all of us in the minds of the world. No mind, Aluno. Uh, thank you very much, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, we want to get into our presentation now. Uh, we want to do it very fast.
So please, the the chair should please get ready. The Zik lecture, the Zik leadership excellence award is going to be presented to High Chief Senator Dr. Ben Dob. E O N. Please round of applause for him. So please may we invite him. Thank you very much. Zix Leadership Excellence Award presented to I Chief Senator Ben Liu BCON in recognition of your relentless exposal of the philosophy and ideals of the great Zik of Africa. Congratulations, sir. Congratulations. Please another round of for him. And his beautiful wife here present. Thank you and congratulations. Congratulations. The second award is going to His Excellency Engineer Dave Umahi, the Executive Governor of a Bony State. Thank you. Excellence in Leadership Award presented to His Excellency Engineer Dave Umahi, Executive Governor. In recognition of your noble leadership and stellar accomplishments in a Bony State and the South is Nigeria. Congratulations, Excellency. Congratulations. The Public Service Leadership Award going to His Excellency, Right Honorable Ifan Ugwani, Executive Governor of Enugu State. Ewa. Thank you. Um, public Leadership Award presented to His Excellency Right Honorable Ifan Ugwani, Executive Governor of Enugu State recognition of your outstanding leadership and stellar and dedicated public service in Enugu State. Congratulations, His Excellency. Thank you very much. The Excellence in Leadership Award is going to His Excellency John Coyote Foyemi Executive Governor, have applause for him, please. Thank you. The former governor of the Kitty State is here. He's going to receive the award on his behalf. Thank you. Excellence in Leadership Award. Presented to His Excellency of the Kitty State in recognition of your stellar accomplishments in leadership in the Kitty State and Nigeria. Congratulations, His Excellency. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. His Excellency, you have double portion because you are also here as the guest speaker. We are going to unveil these uh, wonderful flag. Congratulations. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we want to recognize in a special way 
our great media friend with the Zip Media Excellent Award is going to be presented to Chief Raymond Dopesi, the chairman of the Communication PLC. Thank you. Zip Media Excellence Award presented to Chief Raymond chairman that communications PLC recognition of your unwavering spot to six lecture series congratulations all you've been doing for the six lecture series we thank you thank you thank you Zagada. Thank you. Professor Lilia, with a salute to you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. A great benefactor of Zig Lecture Series here present. Our guests from. We want to respectfully. The former first lady of this great country. The wife of the great Zig of Africa. Professor Uche Azikiwe to address this great country. Your Excellency, ma'am. wonderful location, the governor of Ebony State, my state of origin, <laughs> the benefactor of this uh, lecture series, the benefactor of this lecture series, Ojeli Igbo, distinguished senator, Ben Ndiobi, who has become part and parcel of the Azikiwe family. Abogidu, Ago, please permit me to stand on established protocol because of time. Um, I'm so sorry I came late. You know how our roads are from Monsoka to Oka. What could have taken me one hour or just one hour, 50 minutes? Took me more than two hours. That's why I came late. But I'm happy everything was going on fine when I came in. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor of Namdea Zikiwe University. I pray that every vice chancellor will work according to the spirit of Namdea Zikiwe <laughs> to keep this university, to make it the best in Nigeria. Um, I don't know how to start thanking Chief Ben Obi because it's not easy to run an establishment like the lecture series in a big university like UNISIC. Chief Ben will be, the source will never get dry. <laughs> On behalf of my family, I don't know what to say. I'm only Julianobi because it means that that name, Nam Dezikiwe, will not die. So I want to say thank you to Obi, thank you to the university, thank you to every one of you that have contributed to the success of this lecture series in one way or the other. I want to thank the, the, the governor of uh, our state, Anambra State, 
who has made today work free day on the Anambra. And as we have been pleading, Abogidi has been pleading, let the Southeast see it as a work free day. And maybe the federal government will one day make it a public holiday and it will gladden our hearts. Because we are very happy and we appreciate everything each and every one of you has done to make this a rich success. Dalonu, thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. Diko Kusiel Niaki cannot raise it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think we are doing very well. Um, permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome and recognize the presence of our Chief Sandy Singobu Obukoka. We salute you. No. At the same time, Chief Obi Kachi, we welcome you. Owe Loka is also here. We recognize you. So many people are around. Ladies and gentlemen, may I humbly invite the chair of the organizing committee of this great event, a professor of mass communication and a media guru, Professor Vivian Ifoma Duno. Thank you very much. Because we don't have any more time, I will beg to stand on existing protocol. I am not going to say much, but I'm going to express my profound gratitude first to God for making this possible. Uh, we were thinking it was going to be a Herculean task. How are we going to achieve what we achieved today? But because God was on our side and the committed um, um, uh, uh, determination of all the committee members, we were able to make this a success. So I am saying on behalf of the Zik Lecture Series Committee, a big thank you to everybody that came here. A big thank you to our Vice Chancellor for his support. A big thank you to Onyana Ogam Ojelibo for being there always for us. And to my Advice, Professor A. U. Nonyalo, I will never, ever fail to say thank you. Thank you and thank you again. Thank you, Frank Collins. Thank you, my dean. And thank you to everybody that grades this occasion. Thank you. I hope to see you next year, 2022, November. Thank you very much. I uh, will also thank the University Orator, Professor Chike. Okay, we thank you so much. Uh, please, just one announcement before we take the closing prayer. All our guests will be moving to the council chamber immediately after this. All our guests, while all staff will move to Ozoka Center for some entertainment. All the staff of the university and faculty, please move to the Ozoka Center for entertainment. Right, Professor Nkechi Ngokoye to please come up and lead us in the closing prayer. Professor Ngokoye. Let's be on our feet as to appreciate the Most High God for what He has done today. In Jesus' name, we pray. Onyana ne abuchuku. Onyana sopuro no no dunine. Onyema ramaka opipi ani no wa. Mara makamu rugi woke bo. Okamota Namdi Azikiwe. Oba Maragi Meri Ojiwe Biwa. Amaragi Barayoba Owe Lolo Ni Nolo. 
no gen do ya. Amara gi bakwara yo wany bundi dindo ba no bochita ime mumen cheta woru gi woka. Ndibo kuroku si no nya si ya jidi kuj ya mara ni ho jidema. Obuni hi wuri gi woka para woma no putolo dema mere na ile cheti ya no bochita. And yet, Kelegini, he made a nobody tap to my dindy to receive a teacher with Dutana Mahaduma. Emma Ben Kafa, I got to know the cock he beg. Man, I'm a Gimabu Chuku, Nemi Homa Carrier. I went a Kelegin and came a reme. Now, your quaggy decaying a la loca. He could run over a noba cagabua. Equal a quadu noble and cagabuquia. To die in a pine teacher. Kamara gipa kwara nyo baka iburu nkezibo mado mezi wehe. Kwa waga abo gaiga lu solwa eno wa etu eche eche ta wana yu woke na mdaziki we. Ke eche ta kwa yetu ako na ha Jesus. No nyero nyobo la ni maanye. Karesia meka imara gino zizoke. Yera nyaka ni jaye no wa. Kae basi osa mabati hana bata no so. Nareke le chuku goni hiya daye zima. Dihi dihi merupo chuta daye ma. Ka soporogi ni mihenile. Aike kwere ni zawai. Na ha Jesus Christ. Benzai. Thank you. Please, we take the anthems, please, before we go. very much and congratulations please we have to stay wherever we are to allow our guests to move first Mama, 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 mama,